Hi, um, I'm uh, Jørn Øvre from uh, NORCAP, uh, part of NRC. Uh, I'm a senior advisor on the Green Shift, and thanks for having me today. Um, I'd uh, like to start with uh, a quick explanation of uh, what NORCAP is and uh, continue with the sustainable solutions for humanitarian operations and uh, some insight we have gathered on uh, clean energy. Uh, NORCAP is a global provider of uh, experts to humanitarian development and peace building sectors. It's, uh, as I said, part of uh, NRC, and we have uh, at any time almost uh, 400 people out on different missions uh, and uh, around uh, 1,000 active uh, experts within their thematic fields uh, available for deployments. Uh, we support partners to protect people and their environment to strengthen the ability of the vulnerable communities to mitigate the impact of war, of uh, emergencies, of climate change, and to promote clean energy and sustainable solutions in humanitarian and development work. And why do, you, do we have a, a session on safe and sustainable settlements? It's because um, the big operations have big impact on their environment of where we are operating and also with the, all the logistics and uh, transport of people and goods, uh, as well as uh, the resources uh, that are used in humanitarian operations. So to be able to work on the green shift of operations, we need to ensure that uh, environment is a clear consideration when we set up the big humanitarian operations. Um, this uh, publication uh, was started initially with the, the Satari response, uh, where we were trucking uh, 4 million liters uh, of water into the camp and 2 million liters of water out of the camp. And uh, the gray water started to pollute the groundwater. And it uh, kind of became the starting point on the approach presented in the Sustainable Settlement pu uh, publication. Uh, in close collaboration with the NRC core competencies, NORCAP uh, uh, developed uh, this kind of uh, operational and philosophical platform uh, where the starting point is re a regenerative approach. Nothing should go to waste of the resources we have available to support humanitarian operations. Uh, and then uh, it provides a uh, methodology on how to assess the different available solutions where uh, you have a, a methodology to map uh, how uh, uh, dif uh, different uh, solutions would fit your context. So by using these parameters uh, and compare them to the long range of uh, examples in the publication, uh, it will become easier and more uh, uh, and fit better in the argumentation on how we can uh, move the green shift. Uh, and also to support us on knowledge and capacity building and uh, analysis, uh, NORCAP is working with the GPA to promote sustainable energy and humanitarian responses. And as you see, all these uh, uh, actors, are, all these stakeholders are part of the steering committee. And um, we hope that uh, this work will also be 
brought into the big operations um, to ensure ownership and engagement in the agencies, the partner organizations. We are deploying people to support startup of projects, to help doing assessments on what kind of sustainable or clean energy related uh, program activities that could benefit uh, your operations. And we do have the expertise and capacity available. So we will be able to, to support you with both advice, but also with the people in direct support of the operations. And uh, we often argue that uh, energy is across sectoral and across SDG enabler. We see that uh, we improve the quality of programming by transitioning from fossil fuels to clean energy. And uh, it helps the work we do in the different sectors of the humanitarian emergency responses, and it supports uh, the deliverance on the sustainable development goals. Uh, the GPA provides a lot of information and uh, guidance on what exists and uh, how to benefit from the different existing solutions. So please uh, check out the Energypedia and uh, use all its very useful resources. There are, of course, a lot of other resources uh, available, both uh, the, in the urban context, on financing different solutions, on how to deal with the waste in uh, clean energy operations. And uh, we will share all these resources uh, in the uh, after session reading package. So, First of all, be engaged and uh, think about uh, finding better uh, sustainable solutions. Uh, look for uh, the opportunities to ensure that you take part in the transition from fossil fuel uh, to clean energy operations and uh, make sure to contribute to this green shift of humanitarian operations. And please contact us, both if you need support from uh, experts and also if you need support on capacity building or resources or uh, any other requests coming from uh, your work on doing the programming or um, uh, building the capacity of uh, your uh, team. Thanks a lot. So we're going to have a little look at definitions. Um, we're then going to have a look at who the immediate beneficiaries of humanitarianism and environmentalism. We'll then have a little look at budgets. And then we'll look at the fact that it's rarely black and white. And lastly, we'll talk about balance, scale and context. So there's a couple of definitions here, and just for the sake of simplicity, they both come from the same dictionary. We have humanitarianism, and we have environmentalism. So if I just read these out, humanitarianism, a belief in improving people's lives and reducing suffering. And then we have environmentalism, an interest in or the study of the environment in order to protect it from damage by human activities. So environmentalism, hooray, sounds great. Humanitarianism, hooray, sounds great. If we look closer, we can see some tensions there. So humanitarianism is a belief in improving people's lives and a particular group of people and in the humanitarian sector, we look at the marginalized, we look at the most vulnerable. With environmentalism, 
We're looking at the environment. We're protecting the environment. Through doing that, we are protecting people, but it's not the same direct objective. And we're actually looking at protecting the environment from people. Similar groups of people sometimes, sometimes different groups of people. So there's a few tensions there. And the reason I'm trying to talk about that is because there's a lot of noise out there around climate change. And that's very justified. It's a really urgent problem. But we do need in the humanitarian sector for various reasons to prioritize what we are paying attention to. And for that reason, it's useful to reflect on these tensions. So humanitarianism doesn't equal environmentalism. It feels good to be a humanitarian. It feels good to be an environmentalist. And both of those things achieve fantastic goals when we can be successful. But one is not the other. So in terms of the immediate beneficiaries of humanitarianism and the immediate beneficiaries of environmentalism, this is a pie chart showing some research that we did recently with cluster coordinators. So there were 20 coordinators that responded to our consultation and we asked them what their priorities were for research what would they like new knowledge about what would they like evidence about to help them do their job properly and and feel that they were supporting people in difficult situations and you can see that the the green piece of the pie is climate change and alongside that there are many many other considerations that these guys are faced by in the field every day in 20 different countries and 20 different humanitarian crises. We've got the longer term, you know, that connection between relief and recovery and how difficult it is to support people to go further than just have their lives saved. Cash and markets approaches, which in some contexts can improve people's agency and their control over their futures. The wider impacts of shelter and settlements, health, livelihoods. Gender-based violence, one of the prevalent issues in certain crises where many, many people are, are suffering incredibly. And it goes on, many, many different considerations. There's actually 13 more considerations that were only mentioned by one or two people. So they don't appear on this particular chart. But if you can imagine the range of different humanitarian issues and climate change was only one that came up, you could say, well, hang on a minute, doesn't that mean that humanitarians are looking at the wrong things? Maybe humanitarians need to pay a little bit more attention to climate change. Or you could say that there are some things where climate change will enable humanitarianism and there are some things where it won't. So this is quite a, a banal, simplistic Venn diagram. And you could argue um, for a long time about which belongs in which section. And so we have a big orange circle, which represents humanitarian assistance and the type of activities around humanitarian assistance. And we have a big yellow circle that represents environmental action. One way of looking at this is to say that in the crossover, you have activities that have a clear benefit for humanitarianism and environmentalism. And in, in terms of the climate charter, perhaps, and you, you could argue either way, perhaps what's in the middle aligns more with the sustainability that's discussed in the first objective of the climate charter. And maybe the second one, which is more about maybe sort of greening the response, lies more towards environmental action, but the immediate beneficiaries in certain contexts are not necessarily those marginalized and vulnerable groups who we deal with. It's one way of looking at it. So in humanitarian assistance, we need to support people's livelihoods. That doesn't necessarily give you anything in terms of environmentalism. But if you look at, for example, sustainable planning in the middle, 
that has both a humanitarian outcome and an environmental outcome. And there are things that lie within, things that lie without. And this will change depending on the context that we're working in. So it, it gives you sort of priorities, I suppose, of you know, what is it actually worth investing the energy and resources in and time in your particular context? Is it achieving your humanitarian goals? Does that overlap with environmental goals? Or are the environmental goals becoming, dare I say it, a distraction from your humanitarian goals? This is where it gets a bit tricky. So at the moment, there is a certain amount of funding for climate change, addressing climate change. And there's a certain amount of money for addressing humanitarian issues. And there's an overlap with some of that. Now, that could be great. If you look at the, the orange circle, if we can coordinate and innovate with environmentalists and we can overlap those budgets, then we can achieve a lot of things. And if those things remain overlapped with the orange circle and can achieve humanitarian outcomes, that is great. However, if we get confused by the noise and if we're not prioritizing, then, oh, I'll go back in a minute, um, then that yellow circle starts to take a chunk out of the orange one. People still feeling comfortable. So if we go back a bit, this is from the um, Global Humanitarian Assistance Report, just showing the underfunded appeals um, since 2011. So usually the appeals get to be about 60% funded and there's a shortfall. So wouldn't it be great if some of that environmental budget could help us overlap and fill in some of that shortfall. Fantastic. But on the other hand, if we are being asked by donors, for example, to put time and energy and resources into, in a certain context, measuring the carbon footprint of a tent, but we're not getting the time and energy and resources to measure the instances of GBV and how we can maybe expand a camp and not have so much overcrowding and therefore reduce GBV, then that gets uncomfortable. So we need to be thinking about what these budgets that we're being offered are actually for and how to use them best. But it's really clear cut. That's where the big banal Venn diagram starts to fall apart slightly. So in a really remote area, for example, after the Nepal earthquake, you know, are you going to ditch helicopters and use donkeys to get to the most remote areas because donkeys don't use jet fuel? Or are you going to get to those remote areas quickly just after the earthquake because you know people are suffering? It's a banal example for a reason to make a point. Maybe a more realistic example is, as I've mentioned, when you have a camp which is getting influxes regularly and you only have been given this particular piece of land that's a particular footprint by the local authorities, and you need to negotiate with them and the host community to actually cut down a whole load of trees because you need the space, because the instances of violence in that camp are getting so bad. So this is where balance, scale, and context come in. And one thing that can help with this maybe is a little bit more evidence-based decision-making, digging around and seeing, okay, well, in this context, what are the numbers? What is the problem? What's the scale of this? And how do we balance the degradation of the, um, the environment and the suffering that people are experiencing? I'm going to use some quantitative data. Um, I'm not a massive fan because I think quantitative data can be manipulated quite easily and sometimes more so than qualitative data. But I'm trying to make a point. So I'll, I'll caveat this by saying that, you know, these numbers, you can dig into them. Um, and you can argue against, but it's to make a point. So this is sub-Saharan Africa from space at night. And the total electricity use for more than a billion people covering all of 48 sub-Saharan African countries except South Africa is less than that used by Spain. So that gives you a little bit of scale, a little bit of context. 
going zooming in a little bit more. So this is from a, a paper where they calculated, they sort of modeled the um, energy use, uh, especially electricity use within a camp, refugee camp of 30,000 refugees. Now, if you compare their findings with the energy use for UK households, a refugee camp with a population of 30,000 refugees requires the same kilowatts of electricity per day to 60 UK households. Again, scale, you know, perspective, context. You could look at humanitarian work and especially response and say, well, you know, it involves a lot of helicopters in, in shelter, it involves a hell of a lot of distributing plastic, and therefore, maybe it's not such a good thing. One of the things I've, I've heard quite a lot in the field is people being very worried about the amount of plastic sheet that's distributed. But again, it's not clear cut. So this is a quote from um, Joseph Ashmore. I've seen people dry rice on it in latrines, as bags, as trousers, as umbrellas. People reuse plastic sheet. It's so much of a commodity that in some contexts people sell it for food. That asks questions about whether it should have been distributed in the first place. Yes. Um, but in a lot of contexts, it's not people are not going to be chucking it in the river. It's also made of HDPE, and in the right circumstances, not every context, but some contexts, some surprising contexts, HDPE is one of the easiest to recycle of the plastics. So balance, context. So hopefully that's given a little bit of food for thought ahead of the, the breakout groups that we've got the, uh, this afternoon. Again, these are not the opinions of any organisation that I'm affiliated with. It's just a bit of food for thought and um, just sort of pushing the, the periphery of our comfort zones a little bit to get things in perspective and maybe just focus the resources and our energy and time in the places where that overlap is really going to work for us in terms of innovating and coordinating better maybe being a bit better at working with each other and, and with new actors. So humanitarianism and environmentalism, both great things, but not the same. They've got different beneficiaries sometimes, and they come from different budgets sometimes. Sometimes they come from the same budget, and that's where it gets interesting. It's rarely black and white, and trade-offs are required, and that's where it gets tricky. But if we can look at balance, look at the scale, find out what the scale is, and do things based on the context that you're in. Evidence-based choices will help us manage those tensions. Thanks very much. Okay, so Sadia, take it away. Hi there. Yay! So, yes, great. That's fantastic. So just very quickly, um, uh, just for now, uh, that was some serious humanitarian persistence right there. We made it, <laughs> but uh, I don't, uh, I don't want to delay the the whole agenda much more. So, what we will uh, propose here, we were supposed to give an overview of the greening uh, efforts of the shelter cluster partners, um, and many of them are online uh, as well. I can see. So, what we will do, so just to very briefly. Um, the shelter cluster uh, environment has been a, a, a mainstreamed uh, team, team uh, uh, through the shelter cluster strategy for many years. So it's not new for us. And there was a persistent advocacy and sort of effort to um, to have that team throughout on the global level and also on country level. And finally, last year, we received some uh, funding from ECHO combined with some funding from BHA, but also our partner organization and the co-lead agencies, UNHCR and IFRC, have put in some serious resources to actually green the shelter response. We have global level initiatives with the big agencies uh, such as IFRC, UNHCR, WFP, and we have country level initiatives. And I won't go into all the details now, uh, but uh, I would uh, just plug in this uh, event that I had uh, popped into the chat earlier and popping in again. So please, we will have, uh, if you're interested in knowing more, please uh, attend our uh, HNPW event that will take place uh, next Wednesday. Um, 
it's from 14 hours to 16 hours Geneva time and it's online. So you will get an overview of uh, what our partners are doing. And then we will also have a discussion about just what we were discussing a little bit before the break with the Lizzie's presentation, this, this, this sort of... Uh, duality between the humanitarian imperative and the environmental issues. How do we mainstream environmental consideration into our humanitarian actions uh, from the get-go, which is very, very complicated, as you saw. But we will go also a bit deeper uh, in that uh, discussion uh, with a, with our panel of very seasoned professionals from the environment uh, and, uh, and shelter space. So with that, back to you, uh, Amelia. Thank you. <laughs> um, so basically, I thought it would be nice just to share some of the efforts um, that are happening um, at NRC, um, because I know that this will be something that is probably happening behind the scenes in other organizations, but we've been developing environmental minimum standards. Um, we've started with looking at our emergencies, livelihood, food security, shelter assessments, and WASH. Um, and here you can see um, the, the shelter standards. But essentially, I'm showing you this. It's not so much so that you can read the small text, although happy to share and discuss with those that are interested. It's more to say that um, this is happening. We are obviously all going to need some kind of environmental minimum standards in our work and it would be great if other people are looking at this and would like to discuss and we can compare efforts um, and then work with the shelter cluster perhaps as well to try and have something that's um, mainstreamed. Um, just to say that the there were several different areas that we looked at but we understood that for some of our country officers they're really not going to be able to meet even some of the minimum standards that ECHO are proposing um, to be mandatory later this year. Um, so we've had, we developed a traffic light system so that um, even country officers that are struggling with um, being able to do any kind of environmental assessments, let alone a NEAT plus um, assessment, um, can have some low hanging fruit, simple things that they can change in terms of reducing their plastic packaging, um, recycling after distributions, um, so that they can feel like they're making an effort um, and a difference and they can move up the scale from red to orange. So yeah, please come and talk to me about that. Um, and I can put you in touch with other sectors as well if you'd like to, to do so. Um, I'm going to use my second minute um, to have a little plug, completely different topic, <laughs> um, to plug the World Urban Forum in Poland that's happening in June. Um, I think this is a really good opportunity for the, um, the humanitarian shelter sector to become a little bit more involved in some of the discussions around housing in urban contexts. Um, there will be some of um, some partners are already presenting and, and joining and being there. It's an in-person event, um, but I just wanted to kind of highlight it and say that if we're talking about longer term solutions, resilience, um, we know that the majority of displaced populations are going to also then be in urban centres. I think it's a, a really good way to start to bridge that um, divide between um, humanitarian and development, shelter, housing, accommodation. Okay, so trying to be super quick. Um, shelter projects, who is doing that one now? I've lost track, Charles. <laughs> Charles, be as snappy as you possibly can. Um, and I also just wanted to say, I'm really sorry that we haven't really been introducing ourselves because we, fall into the habit of we know everybody, um, well not everybody, but most people. So perhaps when we ask questions or when we speak, let's try and remember to introduce ourselves and say who we are. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Charles Parrack from Oxford Brookes University Centre for Development and Emergency Practice. And I am here representing Shelter Projects because I'm on the editorial board of this publication for Shelter Projects. Do we have any slides for the Shelter Projects work? If we don't, that's fine. 
Yeah, so. Okay. Oh, thanks. <laughs> there you go. Perfect. Thank you very much. And I'm so I am here. I'm going to take my two minutes to give you an update on the upcoming Shelter Project's ninth edition. So as you can see from this, there are some copies at the back. This is the latest edition. This is the eighth edition. And also, um, and what it does is it, it publishes case studies of shelter. Um, when we, we've now got the eighth edition, it's, it's an amazing resource of lessons learned, of, of learnings, of evidence, of analysis, of themes. Um, and, and it's the one place where, where the sector really has got together to, to collect stories to collect evidence and to be able to use those to, to influence policy and and this one here this this we've got some copies at the back as well this one shelter projects essentials if you're talking to policymakers if you're talking to people from other sectors about shelter here are the messages that have come out of the shelter projects kind of the, the ten, 10 key messages that we would like to say these are what we want to say about shelter to, to people who are interested in shelter but might not want to know all of the details about shelter so do read that anyway um, but what I'm here to say is that um, is that we um, we published the edition that's here, the eighth edition, with over 25 case studies, uh, with a compilation of key messages, and we translated 35 of those so far out of the whole uh, the whole set into Spanish, French, and Arabic to get um, to get that that uh, uh, to get more people reading it, um, and. Uh, this is a plug for, for, for the next edition of the Shelter Projects, but also a plug for the afternoon session. There's a Shelter Project session with Eva Samalia, Dave Hodgkin, and Amaya Salaya Alvarez. Um, they're going to join us to discuss practices and challenges of the shelter sector and climate change response. The topics and case studies will include greening the response, low impact construction materials, build back safer, and local building techniques, and building resilience in urban areas and much more. And I should say, by the way, I'm making this making this presentation on behalf of uh, Elisa and Marta, who couldn't be here today from Shelter Projects, who, who are, and Elisa is the one um, running the Shelter Projects uh, edition. So the, uh, the, the one thing that I would like to plug today is we're now out for a call for abstracts for the next edition of Shelter Projects. We really would encourage people who've got good case studies to come and bring them and write them for Shelter Projects. Uh, deadline sub for submission for an abstract, if you want to, if you've got a case study to propose is 27th of May, and we can include, uh, abstracts can be submitted in Arabic, English, French, Portuguese, and Spanish. We're looking for projects that have happened 2020 to 22. They don't only need to be about shelter, but related to shelter. So it could be NFIs, cash, HLP, site planning, settlements, IEC, or market programs. And all of the information is on shelterprojects.org. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, good morning. I'm Mary Gordon. I'm in my first year of my PhD study at IRDR UCL. This is the first public presentation I've given about my research idea. Um, okay. So within the domains of disaster risk reduction, humanitarianism and climate change, there's a push for localization. There's a general consensus that local practices are more successful as they give community ownership and are contextually appropriate. This push for localization is reflected in the UNDRR's SENDI framework. After a quick search, I discovered that the term local is found 50 times within a 37 page PDF. I next searched for the term local knowledge and can you guess the result? One. I expanded my search and found that indigenous knowledge and traditional knowledge are both found twice and migrant knowledge once. But what do these terms really mean? What are their defining characteristics? In an era of buzzwords, with today's being localization, what does it mean if an individual is a non-local in a local setting? This question forms the basis of my PhD research idea. My aim is to gain an insight onto how displaced people develop knowledge of their new natural environment and hazard risks. The image on the board is the Rohingya refugee camps in Cox's Bazaar district, Bangladesh. 
This is an example of whereby mass displacement and anthropogenic activities such as deforestation has amplified the impacts of cyclone seasons, leaving residents further exposed to risks from a multiple of hazard types. In my research, I would like to investigate questions such as, do displaced individuals rely on their stories, education and experiences from their previous places of living to understand the new environment and risks? Or do they rely on the assistance of the host communities and humanitarian agencies? Another concept I want to investigate is temporality. Does the frequency of exposure to certain natural hazards increase knowledge and lead to improved disaster preparedness, response and recovery? To date, the literature about experience of disaster as a determinant of appropriate response to future events is contested and very sparse. However, there is strong evidence that disaster prevention strategies such as prior education and training do reduce the extent of loss and damage after an event. Studies have also shown that communities which have been classed as indigenous are often rich in knowledge about environment and natural hazards. And there are a couple of studies which have shown that the arrival of refugees has actually improved the local environment, such as increasing surrounding vegetation cover, which subsequently decreases extent of flood risk. Therefore, I come back to my main question. After displacement, how is knowledge of the environment and natural hazards acquired and then applied by so-called non-locals? So I finished to say that I'm open to receive any comment and feedbacks, and I'm happy to further discuss this topic, idea, and my data collection ideas. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Valentina Rivezzo, and I'm here representing RISE International, and I will quickly give an update about build environment and climate action in Lesotho. First of all, who is RISE? RISE is a US and Lesotho registered no-for-profit organization that is based in Lesotho and focuses on economic uh, development through job creation, skill uh, development and entrepreneurship, specifically in the build environment. Where is Lesotho? Lesotho is a sub-Saharan African region, is landlocked by South Africa, uh, it has 2 million people and half of which live below the poverty line of $2 uh, per day. Because of its altitude, uh, it has one of the coldest winter in sub-Saharan African region and how you can see from the picture, it does know. And it has extreme temperature differences, uh, in particular in winter, that can come up for to 15 to 20 uh, degrees. Uh, unfortunately, despite the cold climate and the large variation of temperature, modern architecture and construction is less energy efficient and requires really polluting um, and dispersing eating techniques. Going back to the environmental and climate condition, although uh, water is abundant, uh, Lesotho unfortunately is prone to severe drought and the majority of water is exported to South Africa. Um, it's also prone to flooding. In February 2021, in fact, it, it uh, experienced heavy rains that caused really damage to infrastructure, fields, and, and households. And at the end, finally, um, is one of the Amon's country worst hit by land degradation and soil erosion. It loses 40,000 um, tons of soil every year. So going back, going to Speaking about the local, the, the build environment, the local building code is, is dated 1984. And as no, there, there are no green buildings standards or regulation and the uh, work of architects and engineers is still not regulated. Moreover, 74% of Lesotho in, is import, is, um, imports are from South Africa and the majority of it is building material. So as stated in the Lesotho National Strategic Development Plan, there is an immediate need of innovation in design and building processes, production of local sustainable building materials, and finally conduct research and encourage the development of domestic material. For this reason, at RISE, we are launching a research and innovation program as 
a climate action in the country. And our first focus is to research and promote the indigenous and local sources materials to have a positive impact on the built environment and the quality of construction methodologies in the country. And finally, why we are here. I'm here to like, uh, ask you if you know about similar research that has already been done in different countries, if you have ideas or suggestions of like best practices for such programs or action, if you have feedback to give us, uh, if you want to collaborate with us, and finally, if you know about joint uh, funding opportunities also. So thank you very much. I'm, I don't know if I'm in the three minutes, but I'm finished. And here are my contact website. And please don't hesitate to contact me or just approach me if you're interested. Juliet Milliken from Realliance, uh, www.re-alliance.org, look us up. Um, we work in regenerative response to disaster displacement and development. Those of you who were here yesterday would have heard from Magnus and B. Um, those of you who are here this afternoon can hear from Magnus. I'm doing a presentation in the breakout group afterwards. Um, I'm really here to tell you about a new publication, which is on our website, which I prepared a beautiful picture of on a different slide. Never mind, look it up. Um, on grey water reuse and rainwater harvesting for food growing in refugee camps that comes out of a pilot project run by Syrian partners in the Northwest. Um, and also to tell those of you who are working with local partners about the new work we're just about to embark on, uh, which is regranting small amounts to local partners to pilot innovative regenerative response in camps and settlements, particularly around energy and communications, around uh, camp-wide composting, for soil replacement and uh, food growing and around urban gardening. Um, and then a couple of later projects, later in, uh, later focuses uh, next year under these bigger areas. Um, we'd like to hear from local partners who are keen to pilot those projects with us and work with us on creating more guidelines for regenerative response. We've heard this morning from Tilly about how we have to move forward with regenerative design. We've heard from Paul about how Disasters will become more frequent and more complex and larger organizations won't cope. And we've just heard this morning about this notion of localization being there, but local knowledge being um, forgotten or overlooked. We're trying to work with local partners to formulate and produce local knowledge in the form of simple guidelines that can be shared so that community organizations in the future uh, will be able to share knowledge and share information and make use of them. Please look us up. Please tell us to your local partners about us if they would like to bid for a pilot project. There is a networking event on the 19th of May where people can find out more about how to apply. The applications are very simple. Applications need to be in by the 20th of June. Um, and we're also keen to have students work with us. We've got lots of opportunities for student interns and volunteers, and we've been promised some. So if there are any students in the room who would like to do some work with us over the summer, please uh, grab me at lunchtime. <laughs>